my formal intro. Welcome. Thank you for coming to the Whalen Library. We are excited to have Holly and Cindy here this evening to talk about planting and cooking with herbs. Um, we are recording this session, so you'll be able to see it on our YouTube and possibly on Waycam. And I think that's all I have. So welcome and thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Holly, and thank you to the Wayland Public Library. Um, I've been a member at the Wayland Public Library for, I don't know, about 24 years. So I did live in Wayland for 24 years and currently live in Framingham. So I'm familiar with Courtney and the library. So thank you again. So this evening, um, as you know, we're going to talk about planting an herb garden and cooking with herbs. And just from a format perspective, I just want to let you know that the first half of the presentation is going to be on planting the herb garden, and that will be with me. And then the second half will be with Holly on cooking with herbs. So a little bit about me. My name is Cindy Jacobs, and my business is Simply Done by Cindy. And I do home organizing and fine gardening. And for those who may not think that the, how do you do both of those, they really have a lot of similarities. It's weeding out what doesn't work anymore and letting go and simplifying and, and beautifying your home, your area. So this interior and exterior home transformations. And I've been doing this since 2002, so I just celebrated 20 years last September. So thank you. Um, and I work in the Metro West area, so um, I'm familiar with the areas around here, and that's where I, most of my clients are. So just to recap on what that means or why I do that or what I do what I do, because I believe that your surroundings are a reflection of you and how you feel. So I like to help people take the chaos out of their lives and bring in the calm, you know, bring in what feels good to you. So with that, we're going to talk about planting an herb garden, which I don't know if you've read a lot lately, but um, gardening is one of the number one stress reducers right now. There's a lot of articles out about it, and an herb garden is a great way to start. So how many of you have an herb garden now or have had one in the past? Just by a show of hands. Great. So most of you have, and that's wonderful. So to get right into this, um, this is fine. Okay. Benefits of an herb garden. So the first thing is physical. Moving your body, being outside, being one in the air and in the soil, it is so good for you. And you're getting the benefits of the vitamin D. How many people go to their physical and the doctor runs the blood work and comes back and says you're lacking in vitamin D? And what do they want to do? They want to put you on a pill, right? They want to give you a supplement which there isn't anything wrong with that. But at the same time, if you can get it just by being outside naturally, why not, right? So mental as well as physical. And the mental is important. Being out and in the garden, and yes, you can wear gloves, and they're important. But you can take some time to put your hand, go into the soil and feel it. That sensory, that experience, it's so good for you. And it's a calming, natural way to reduce stress. Also, just by here, like we can smell that. I can smell this. I don't know if you can smell the different herbs. But the taste, the sight, the touch, the smell, it's amazing. And we all have herbs for different reasons. We're going to talk about cooking, but they also can be you know, just a, a visual pleasing aspect. Lavender, you can bring it into your home for the smell. You put it into, you know, a little vase in the bathroom or in the kitchen. It's amazing. So all of these things are part of the mental benefits of it. When we grow our own herbs, what we're growing, we know what's put into that. So they're pesticide free. When you go to a store and you buy herbs, you don't know if they've been chemically treated. Sometimes you'll know, sometimes you don't. Even the ones that you go to buy when you're going to plant them, if you're not going to grow them from seed, which is pretty common to buy the smaller ones, you want to check and make sure if it says organic. 
Even at Home Depot, they have a brand, Bonnie's brand, and that's organic. Um, some of the other ones are not. And to pay the extra dollar or dollar fifty, I highly recommend it. So get it going organic if you can. And there's lots of great um, places around here to buy them. You have Russell's, you have you know Mahoney's, um, even Franz Flowers. You know, so you can get those options. So the next thing of one of the benefits is functional. Functional to me goes back both on home organizing and gardening. The things that we keep and the things that we have and the things that we use, we want them to be functional. And the herbs are hugely functional. Why not be able to go out to your own garden and cut fresh herbs and use them in your cooking? It's just, it's so easy. It makes you use them more because you've got them right there and they're handy. And it saves time and money. It's a convenience. How many times have you gone to make a recipe and it asks for something that you don't have? And then you've got to run out to the store and go get it, right? And you don't know what you're getting in the store. And it it's just makes you use more of the herbs that you might not necessarily have made in a particular dish. And you'll learn some of the ways Holly will talk about how you can use them and what you can use them in. So where do you begin? The first thing you want to do is review your landscape. And by that I mean your exterior surroundings, your home, where are you going to have this herb garden? So if you have a large home with a lot of land, and you put the herb garden in the far back right corner, is that really going to be conducive to you going out there and using it, being able to get to it easily? So think about where it's going to be. Or are you just going to have some containers that are right on your deck? Really easy, convenient. The placement for the amount of sun is really important. So herbs normally want six hours worth of sun. They can do four to five sometimes, and some are okay with a little bit of shade. But for the most part, you want a placement that's in the sun, right? So you need to look at north, south, east, west, where are you going to get that? And then the water source. So it sounds so simplistic, but I can't tell you how many times people have done an herb garden, and then they don't use it because it's way out in the middle because they wanted not to not have it right up against their deck, but the problem is then they're not using it. So the water source, the spigot, where's the spigot that you're going to get to the hose, and are you going to leave the hose out all the time? Are you going to drag it out? Are you going to use a watering can? So how easy is that watering source going to be? Because let's face it, it, it doesn't rain all the time here, and even if you have sprinklers, um, Wayland closes down sprinklers are probably shut down now already right I don't know the part they go to two days and then one day and so you can't depend on the resources like that you need to be able to have your watering source and then choosing your herbs it's really a personal preference as to how you're going to use them what you're going to do with them are you going to cook with them do you really just want them to bring them inside you know for the smell what do you like to use? What do you cook with? Do you make more soups? Do you use more, you know, chicken and sage and, and you know, thyme? Or are you more going to make, um, you know, tomato mozzarella salad with basil, you know? What do you see? And it's good to really think about that before you just plunge out and go to the store and just buy them. Think about what you want, right? So keys to success of having an herb garden. The first thing after you decide where it's going to be and the amount of sun and where your water source is, you want to look at your soil preparation. What is the base? And one of the rules for vegetables and herbs is a third, a third, a third. So it's a third compost, a third peat moss, and a third soil. Looking at your own soil, one of the things you want to do is put your hands into the soil, pick up some of the soil, and see if it completely crumbles and feels really dry. That's not conducive to a solid base. If it's moist, rich, dark, you see worms, you see bugs, that's good, right? So 
if you don't want to do the third, a third, a third, and churn it you know, with the shovel, then what you can do is go and buy the bagged garden soil. And there's a full gamut of garden soils out there. What you want to lean away from is what's called topsoil. So topsoil is what you would use for uh, when you're reseeding your lawn, okay? <laughs> Which, how many of us have had to do that a few times, right? So topsoil is good for that but it's not really conducive to a vegetable garden or an herb garden. And then there's various types of soils they'll list in ground. Okay, so if yours is in the ground, then you can use that. If you're using it with containers, because we're gonna talk about the test sizes, if you're using it in a container, then you want the soil that says container use. And you'll see things on the outside like vermiculite and um, all kinds of nutrients, okay? Those are great. And if you can just buy the garden soil, especially if it's a smaller place, you don't have to deal with all those additives into it. It already comes there. So that would be my suggestion if you're doing on a smaller basis, so container size. Some tools to make sure that you have garden gloves. I don't always use them. When you're dealing with smaller things, you tend to not want to use them because what happens is the glove will break it off. So you can use it, but when you're really dealing with things that are smaller, you want to try not to use them. But if you're working in a wet environment, use the gloves that have some rubber on the outside. Um, just make sure if you're not um, allergic to something that's in it. And the gloves, you want to have them fit you. You don't want to have the gloves too big and you've got all this space because you want to be able to get in to pick and get what you want. A hat. Sounds so silly, but right? Sunscreen and a hat have protection. And these little trowels, if you're doing a small little container, then those are good. But otherwise, you can just use a standard three-prong to pull up the weeds. And, and I'll be showing a video to you shortly. It, you don't have to get every single little tiny weed. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just want to make sure that you're cleaning it out and maintaining it. And drainage. Um, the pots that are out today, for the most part, will have drainage. But you need to check. And sometimes there'll be a hole for the drainage, but nobody's pushed out that plug. So you can easily push out the plug. If it isn't coming out easy, use a flathead screwdriver. Use some kind of force behind it to get the plug out. What I will caution you on, because I've seen this before, is if you have a container that has your drainage, but you decide you want to put that where soil is, so you're not putting it on top of a deck or a hard surface, what happens is when there's heavy rains, it doesn't drain properly, and it can't drain. And so it gets backed up with all this moisture, which can then can cause mold, mildew, those kind of stuff. So you don't want that. What you do is just get some pieces of little flagstone or bricks or something to put underneath it to give it even just an inch of space in between the ground and the pot. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions? Okay, we're moving on to small versus large. A lot of times we have a space that's got a deck or a patio and we don't have a big yard anymore or maybe we never did. So does that mean I can't have an herb garden? Absolutely not. You need to think about horizontal and vertical. This is a vertical and it's literally, they sell them online, they're almost like little bags and they've got um, you know, a proper material to be able to have herbs and you can hook them on a fence you can nail them up. They're great, great option. This is an old piece of a table that's used to give some separation. And this is when it was first started. This is the garden, ironically, that I went to today. But this is the overgrown part. Plus, I took some too. So it's huge now, but still has separation. You might just want to start small and just have a, a box, put some herbs in it, make some holes. Give yourself a little space. 
This is a strawberry pot. They're great to use for herbs because they already have the separation built into them. And it's super cute, easy. Um, you can use anything. Keep in mind some of them are going to heat up more than others, depending on where they are. And so if you're moving them at all. But light lightweight is great. I don't like as much plastic, per se. I would use like a lightweight comp composite. They sell them at Home Depot, at Lowe's, very inexpensive. The heavier ones, keep in mind if you've got to move that, that's a project, right? Or if you've got the strong man or woman at home, right? So, does that answer your question? Yes, and the slide you showed was really good lighting for the strawberry pot. Do you have one that you would recommend as a lighting? Um, so, s over time, they can deteriorate. Most of them are usually okay, but if you're in a windy area, that can go flying over because the soil isn't going to stay super moist. It's going to dry out before. So, you know, it's really, if you're buying it and it's really inexpensive and you're getting it from Ocean State Job Lot and you, you know, lose $15, you know, like I'm just trying to be realistic. Um, I would say whatever works best for you to be able to move that because if you want to bring that back in, Yeah, I don't use the plastic. I do too. Composites? No, it's um, it's a different material. Um, you can look it up. Um, the, some of them are uh, Campania is one of the ones that makes a nice composite material. Okay. Um, you know they're they're more expensive, but they last longer. Um, they sell them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my clients all have, um, a lot of them have used Campania. One, one thing good about plastic is it does get out of the soil. Yeah, that's why I said the heat, yeah. I, I wouldn't do the plastic. There's a lot of composite ones out there now that are pretty inexpensive. You can get them online. Yeah. Or even ceramic ones, Ocean State Job Lot, at the beginning of the year, will sell them. So that's what I would stick with, just to be safe. So on the larger, and if you have more room, you have options, right? So on the left, you'll see raised beds. That's been all the rage. These are old raised beds. This client, uh, this came with the house. And her, it's kind of a funny story. She has two young children, and her mother-in-law would come every year and say, oh, how are the weeds doing in your beds? And so her incentive was, I don't want to hear that one more time from my mother-in-law. I need to do something with this. So I helped her, and we removed all of the weeds. The soil was excellent, um, had a lot of bugs and worms. But I added compost just to give it that nice, rich, added base. And literally all I did was bag the compost, put heaps of it, and then churn that around with a shovel. And then we planted veggies and herbs in one of them and in the other one we did wildflower seed she had again the two young children they wanted to see how things grew from seed and it was it was pretty fun and um yeah her mother-in-law had nothing but good things to say yay did you ever speak to them or did it take a while for them to come to you for any advice so on the larger beds i do tend to always fertilize i do tend to give it a good base and a good start even had a bigger um, garden in Wayland when I had a, more land. The garden soil, the organic garden soil, it's already got it in it, so you really don't have to. I churn it around, and if it still feels rich and has the bugs, then you don't have to. But t on the bigger ones, to give it that good base, I would. And when did you start it? At the beginning. Okay. This is um, a rock wall bed, and what's nice about this, if you look at the terracotta pot, if you can see that, it gives you an idea of how high 
that bed is. And when you're gardening and if you're having it down low, you need to think about how much you're bending over and reaching. And as we get along in our year, sometimes we don't want to be bending and doing all of that. So that's a great way to have it because then it's up higher and more useful and more functional. I love this one on the bottom. That is not my client, but I just thought that was the coolest picture. An old bathtub painted red. They made holes in the bottom. And I bet they're going to make a lot of pesto. That's what it looks like. This um, garden bed is right after, before we planted the new herbs. This is what came back from the year before, um, what was planted the year before and came back. So on this side is where she plants her um, tomatoes and zucchini, and on this side is where we plant the new herbs. So things like peppermint come back, spearmint is in here, um, rosemary, some of the basil will come back, and then we'll plant the new stuff, you know, pl put in the new cilantro, put in the new basil. So taking care of your beds, right, allows you to have the fruitfulness of that labor for the following year, and they come back. And you might want to augment them. So the next slide is going to have a... Maintaining an herb garden, cutting off the top base and the flowering part of it. So I'm just going to show that and play that for you now. So on this top part here, you can see these little white flowers and this long, leggy stem. Mm -hmm. And you cut the stem so it takes away the legginess of it. And you cut the flowers. Because that takes away the energy putting it into the flowers. Okay? So rather than... Um, no, you can use, so the difference with the chives is people use, and Holly will talk about, use that part of it. And also, if, for, if it's for looks and for sensory stuff, it's really pretty the, with the chives. The looks for this with the white, not so much. And then at the end, it just talks about really making a good trimming. So the reason when you have the herbs and you come in, you want to cut them and take a good amount off. So in that lemon balm, when it gets all leggy, and t you, know, you want to cut it and make some good. I'm not going to torture you anymore with this video. Um, so I just want to show you where to cut. If you see this auxiliary bud coming out, you want to pinch or cut right above it. Okay, because because that part can still grow. I'm going to just let this. Um, so are you saying that the carrots? Oh, no. Give me a second. Where did it go? There. Okay. So in, in the video, yeah. you see those just double lines? Yeah, stop that. So I also wanted to just mention I would recommend labeling the herbs that you put in. Sometimes you forget, and if you're new to this, there could be a slightly different type of parsley. There could be a different type of basil. Um, and when you cut it back, it increases the growth, and you can use scissors or clippers. Do you use like the popsicle stick with the? Yeah. Yep. Candy. Candy. 
you might have to just get a new one once once a year that you kind of just put it in when you do the new one again. Yeah. I know. When the it does. Sharpie. With the, I was in the garden club for many years, and we used to use um, yellow ones and write them in black. Um, it did last a little bit longer than the beige popsicle right. stick one, but there is no. I'm sure with all the women that have been in that club, if there was some magic, um, unless you made a little chart and you got like colored popsicle sticks, <laughs> you know, and you said orange is for my basil, and but then you'd always be thinking about it. So I would say at the beginning of the year, just go out and make that little bit of, you know, time to do it. So in summary, on my portion, you want to be sure you have proper drainage. It's key. You want to compost if it's on the larger ones, and you want to use organic garden soil, depending on if it's in-ground use or containers. Make sure you're getting the proper one. And the placement is huge, starting from the beginning to ensure success. Where is it going to be, not only for you to get to it, but to get a water source to it and to be able to get out there and use it. And I literally keep it simple and have fun. Enjoy it. It's a fun, functional thing and gives you so many benefits. What do you put in the compost? The herbs? When they come in a little container like that, I don't, you just, uh, well, after you make your soil all loose, you just put it right in and you don't want to put soil on top of it. You just want the soil to butt up it's around. It's the same. You can, so on a lot of things on plants, you go slightly higher, but on the herbs, I don't actually. I just keep it right around the same. Does that make sense? So planting is always after the first after the f any sign of a frost to come. We're in New England. Sometimes we just never know. I always make sure it's after Mother's Day. And a good idea is to, when it comes out in the stores, that's when it's usually accessible. If you don't want to wait too long, because then it's that you're getting like what's left. And it kind of doesn't look so good. So people are still planting them right now they just started like right after mother's day i wouldn't i personally won't go any earlier i won't pl even though when everyone's running to the store and doing it because then you have that frost and then you're really bummed and if you're planning to have things like that you'll notice you know people come in for the dessert yeah Nothing. yeah no because <laughs> cold now. yes and then the opposite is happening you know depending on what you believe or don't believe without getting into a foot with them. You know, climate change, you, what happens is I did the winter, I do uh, pansies and um, some heuchera and hellebore and things like that for clients, for planters. And this year, what happened, we got 91 degrees, two days of it. And what happened? The lupine looked like, you know, everyone was, you know, freaky. I'm like, okay, it's because we had the heat. It isn't anything you've done, just... Give it a little bit of time. So we're in that. So if you wait till at least after Mother's Day, um, and worst case scenario, if you know it's coming and you know it's going to be really cold, you can put a piece of like burlap or something over it um, just to kind of protect it a little bit. Do you have a place that you mark the seeds in there? Like where is it? Is it like in the ground or is it like on the ground or is it like on the tree or is it like in the tree or is it like in the ground? Or is it like in the garden? Or is it like um, there's some variations, you know, some, like, some can do better with some shade, like chives can do well in the shade. Um, basil doesn't like things beating down on it. But there'll be little tags and read the labels, trust the labels. You know, they'll say part sun, full sun. But most of the time it, it wants six hours. You can get away sometimes with four to five, but it wants six hours. And they will go all the, uh, the basil and the parsley, 
will go, I mean, you can sometimes keep having your basil in like almost October, you know, depending on when it's not, you, you know. So it just depends on on how where you are, where your proximity is. It's mostly the adjustment. It's the adjustment. So if you wanted to, start bringing them in a little bit here and there. That's what we do with some of the outdoor tropicals too. They just don't, it's just a big adjustment and it's just a lot for them to handle. All right, so I am going to turn it over to Again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm really excited that you're all here. Um, I am a functional medicine health coach. I work with individuals who are frustrated with their health to help them learn how to live in their bodies. And my clients come to me with autoimmune disease, allergies, IBS, hypothyroid, psoriasis. They've been to the doctor and the doctor says, you're just getting older, you need to lose weight, um, it's genetic, but they still don't feel well, and they don't have anyone holding their hand to walk them through what needs to be done. So what I do is I, I help my client look at the root causes of disease, and we use nutrition, education, and holistic intervention to reverse the root causes of disease. And the root causes are often diet and nutrition, stress or our environment. There are a lot of toxins in the environment. A lot of people have heavy metal toxicity or mold toxicity and they don't know it, but they don't feel well and they're tired and they have anxiety. And so I help them decipher, you know, are they intaking the right nutrients? Are they digesting their food? And if so, are the nutrients getting into the sun into the cells, are they dehydrated? So that's what I do. Um, before we go any further, what I'm gonna talk about tonight is for informational purposes and not for the purposes of providing medical advice or giving medical opinion. Even if, even if we were to work together and I was your health coach, I do not yet know enough about you to give you specific advice. So this is general advice. So the basics of food. The question is, why do we eat food? Why do you eat food? Why, why does anybody eat food? I'm hungry. Energy. So I break down eating food into three categories. One is emotional, right? There are dopamine receptors in the brain. If it tastes good, then we wanna do it again. But the same is good for other things that we do, right? Um, a thrill or a shopping spree, like it, it feels good, so we wanna do it again. So we don't often do it for the right reasons. We don't often eat for the right reasons. Often we're eating sugar or processed foods. So herbs can have that pungent smell, that fragrant smell, and they also can act to the dopamine receptors. The second reason we eat is social. Have you, okay, even I ski. So even if I'm skiing or hiking or whatever activity it is, always at the end there's food, right? Have you ever been to like a family event where there's no food? Has that ever happened? Or maybe it's afterwards or before and then, you know, you play volleyball or whatever. But social, we're very social eaters. And the third reason is nutrition. You talked about energy. We eat to survive. We eat for growth and function and for preventing and fighting disease. Um, Everything we eat or drink either feeds disease or fights it. And herbs are one of the most nutrient-dense foods we have available to us. So today I'm going to talk about how to cook with herbs. So 
it was said at one of my workshops, plants have their own immune system. And that is so true. It, you know, as humans, we have a very complex immune system. We have an innate and an adaptive immune system. So the innate is a passive immune system, and then the adaptive immune system is acquired. But plants only have an innate immune system, and it adapts to the environment. So that's why when, I'm gonna assimilate this to bees, when, when you have allergies and you eat honey that was grown in the environment where the bees are, the bees are taking the pollen from the plants, and then if you eat the honey from a local honey farmer, it's gonna help with the allergies because the plant is adapting to the immune system. Um, so to survive, plant cells sense their immediate surroundings, and they change their activity according to the microenvironment. And this is accomplished through cell signaling. So I'm not gonna get into what cell signaling is, but um, plants select different antioxidants through pe uh, plant evolution to protect every part of the plant against oxidative damage. And when we eat homegrown plants, we're eating the plant's immune system according to the environment, just like I was talking about with honey and the bees. Um, so the health benefits, plants make a lot of antimicrobials, uh, proteins. Um, and, and Cindy talked about this when she was talking about the soil. I mean, kids who live on farms have a lot fewer allergies and they have fewer illnesses because they're touching the animals. They have their hands in the soil. Our skin is like a giant mouth. We absorb nutrients and we absorb um, antimicrobials through the skin. And when we're touching it, it's really good for us. I mean, Cindy talked about putting on gloves, but there's, there's something to be said about touching the soil and being one with the soil. Cindy also talked about vitamin D. And, uh, you know, my big thing is a pill for an ill. Like, you know, that's the allopathic met method. And I'm very holistic. Um, a lot of people take vitamin D, a pill, or they get it from the sun. Now, even if you put sunscreen on, you're blocking the vitamin D. Um, but I talk with my clients about magnesium. You need magnesium in your body. Your magnesium has to be replete in order to absorb the vitamin D. So sometimes people take vitamin D or they're in the sun a lot and they have muscle aches and they think it's from the vitamin D, but what it's from is it's a depletion of magnesium. So we have to look at the whole person. Um, so I got off track. Um, herbs and spices are the most antioxidant dense dietary source. The fresher the plant, the more disease fighting the organism. And homegrown plants are fewer pa pesticides. And Cindy touched on this. And I did a, a workshop a while back for Poesit Farms on organic, conventional versus uh, local. And Cindy was talking about how organic is better. And organic is good, don't get me wrong, but local is also good because the shortest amount of time it goes from the farm to your plate, to your mouth, the more nutrient dense it's gonna be. So if you pick a strawberry and you eat it, there's gonna be so many more nutrients than if the farmer picked it in like California two weeks ago, and while it was on the truck coming to your house, it was ripening because they picked it green and ripening is a dying process. When you get the strawberry, it's red. And you think, well, it's a ripe strawberry, but you're losing some nutrients when it doesn't ripen from the sun and when it ripens in the truck. So the same thing is true for herbs and plants. So if you have herbs, fresh herbs, and I don't know if you can smell it now, but when Cindy walked in with her box, the whole room smelled. I mean, it, it smelled delicious. 
And this is a really good time of year to start a garden. Okay, I'm gonna talk about basil, parsley, I have a couple recipes and I made copies of the recipes for you. So um, basil has a lot of antibacterial properties to protect against harmful bacteria. It combats stress by acting as an adaptogen. I'm gonna talk about one research study. Researchers studied the anti-stress effects of basil leaves given to rabbits. The rabbits were exposed to a high stress environment. They found a significant improvement in oxidative stress levels after the rabbits received supplements of two grams of fresh basil leaves for 30 days. So that's a lot of basil for a rabbit, right? Um, there are three key points in the results. One is that it improved cardiovascular and respiratory protection in response to stress. Two is that it decreased blood sugar levels. And it's not because the rabbits weren't eating, you know, sugar from the pantry. It's, it actually decreased the levels. And the third is that increased antioxidant activity. So. And now we'll talk a little bit about cooking with basil. Um, there's, I have three pictures here. There are many different kinds of basil. Those are the varieties, but this is Thai basil. Um, and here's a little tip. Uh, thai basil, you have to be sure to balance the amount of parsley that you use with the basil. So it, it eliminates any aftertaste when you match the two. Uh, there are two kinds of basil on the end, the, the red Reuben and the big leaf. So the big leaf is the most common. Um, you can put it in Italian food, salad dressings, and drinks. You can, it's, it's in medicine such as cough medicine and other natural elixirs. The red Reuben is really good for pork, in case you eat a lot of pork. And the lemon basil, I love lemon basil, you can add a touch of lemon to any dish without actually using a lemon. I just love the way lemon basil tastes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about parsley. A lot of health benefits of parsley. It, can, it contains about three times the amount of vitamin C by volume as an orange. So parsley has a lot of vitamin C. It's extremely important for healthy immune function and skin and joints. It's also good for adrenals. The adrenals are on top of the kidneys and when you have stress, the adrenals need vitamin C to function properly. They have chlorophyll, which uh, is an energy producing substance. It helps to alkalize the body Americans are on a SAD diet, which stands, SAD is an acronym, which stands for Standard American Diet. We have a lot of processed foods that are very acidic. So these plants are alkaline the body, it purifies the blood, and it forms new red blood cells. It also has folate, which reduces homocysteine levels. Homocysteine is a blood marker and I use it with clients to um, assess methylation sufficiency. So methylation is like when you get rid of toxins in your body. So it's like taking out the trash. So if your homocysteine levels are high, it means your body's having a really hard time getting rid of the junk in it. And so, uh, Homocysteine is also an inflammatory mediator and it's linked with cardiovascular disease and brain degeneration. It's an important nutrient for cancer prevention. So parsley is really good for helping with that. They sell both in the supermarket and they both have the same nutrient. You know, 
it's really funny because people view garnish as like something you don't eat. I went to a networking meeting like last Friday or the Friday before, and I'm gluten free and dairy free. So I don't eat any gluten. No, Elizabeth is too. <laughs> So I went to this networking meeting and there was a plate of bagels and a plate of croissants. And on the plate was some strawberries to make it look pretty. So I ate one of the strawberries. And then when they were cleaning up afterwards, I could see that you know, they took the plates away and all the strawberries were there. People think that the garnish is there to make it look pretty. Just like you, know, you think that the curly leaf parsley is there for a garnish, but all of these garnishes have nutrients in them, and we just don't think about it. We think it, of it visually, but we don't think about it nutritionally. No, it's a different herb. Yeah, cilantro is a different herb than parsley. It also has a, a different medicinal quality too. Uh, some people eat cilantro and they 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 taste soap in their mouth. Because I can't remember what it says, but They're different. No, they're all herbs. I, I didn't. Um, I didn't plan to talk about cilantro, but but I I love to be challenged, and you should definitely like. We should talk about it. Like, I I offer a free thirty minute discovery session, and especially since you brought it up, we should talk about it. We should we should plan a, a time. That's my next workshop. We're going to talk about cilantro. Yeah. So kitchen prep, um, it's really important to wash produce um, because produce can have bacteria on it. And, and pretty often we eat herbs that are raw. I mean, you can, you can cook herbs and that kills some of the bacteria. It's called the kill step. But pretty often we eat herbs that are raw or even like tonight I made um, a stir fry uh, with uh, snap peas and carrots, onion, like red onion, chicken. And I was going out to get the herbs. Oh, I should have, I meant to like pass this around. Um, I'm gonna talk about it in just a minute. And this is my mint, <laughs> but yeah, I, I can pass this around to you if you want to smell it, but yeah. Um, so soft herbs like basil, cilantro, and parsley are typically served fresh, which means that eating them can expose you to harmful bacteria. Um, so the way we wash it, there, there are two ways to wash it. One is in the colander. We run cold water over it. And the second way is to put it in a bowl and get all the soot off of it. And if the bowl is sooty, you have to take it out, empty the bowl, and do it again until the water is run clear. Um, if the herbs are caked with a lot of dirt, just keep repeating it. And water, water only is best. People, people ask me, well, should I use a cleanser on my herbs? I'm like, no, <laughs> we don't want more chemicals in our bodies. Um, but if, if you see a lot of dirt and 
you think you know you want a little extra help you can use like a very small amount of white vinegar with the water and that's a natural cleanser um, you should only wash herbs when you're ready to use them because ex ex excess moisture shortens their shelf life in the refrigerator um, so is this first Um, so thyme, so this is lemon thyme, it's important to add visual, so you should like pat this around, yeah, I would love to see if it looks like, I kind of, it's all in water in it, so I don't expect it to be, but I, they're all there for the taking, so they're an okay. easy way to give you a gift, which you're going to need, yeah, I'm going to talk, this the whole thing. so what you do, uh, to strip the rosemary leaves from the stem, we don't have rosemary here. Uh, you pull the knee, you pull it in the opposite direction from which they grow, and it should easily slide off. So you pull it in the opposite direction with time. You pull the stem through a sieve, like a wire mesh strainer, and you pull it through in the opposite direction, and that should take it off. Um, so with soft herbs like parsley, cilantro, and basil, you can eat the stems because it's a soft stem. Now that may depend on visual. So if you're making a bruschetta or something where you want the leaves to show, um, you're obviously going to take them off the stem. But if you're making something in like a mini chop or in like a crock pot where you just want the nutrients or the flavor or the aroma, then you can eat the stem. You can eat the stem. Um, and you can put them in soup stock. The stems, you can compost them, especially the woody stems. Like we talked about soft stems or woody stems. So these are a woody stem. You can see it's hard. You're not going to eat the stem. Um, so you can chop them with a knife. The chives, oh, I, I didn't finish what I was saying. So I went out in my garden. I took, these are the chives with the purple, soft chives, and took those out. I, I cut chives with a scissor into like little bitty pieces. And after everything is cooked, then I put them, after they're chopped up, then I put them in my, in my chicken. Because you don't want to cook them because they're going to, raw they're going to have more qualities right just like raw garlic is better for medicinal purposes than cooked dark garlic which is sweeter okay this is one of the recipes that i shared with you um, under the feedback form the parsley kidney cleanse tea and you know i one of my mentors is a naturopath and she's very big on um on teas on different teas and this says to cover and simmer for 10 minutes but you can you can take tea and you can make it and put it into like a ball jar like a like a jar with a lid and you can put it in the refrigerator and then you'll have iced tea and you can drink it you know, for a couple days, especially in the summer. Um, so you guys have that recipe. And this is the slide where I wanted to talk about chives. You can see that this is a little bit fresher. My chives are kind of like a little browner because it's a little bit, I think last week they probably looked like that. Um, a <laughs> So chives have the purple flowering plant and it looks very pretty. You can put chives in cream cheese. You can use it in eggs. I just talked about how I put it in my chicken tonight. You can use it as a garnish in pastas or soups. You can chop it and add it into salads. You can use it in a like an egg bake or a frittata. 
you can make a pesto with pine nuts, olive oil, Parmesan cheese, fresh parsley. You can add it to smoothies for more nutrients or a flavor boost. You can put it on homemade pizza. And again, if you're making homemade pizza, you don't want to put the chives or cilantro in the oven because it's going to burn, right? You're going to cook whatever it is you're going to cook. And then once you take it out and you're going to serve it, you put it on top. I just like, I have a 20 year old and an 18 year old. And I just love it when I add something green and it like hides in there and they like put it on the fork. I'm like, oh, they're getting a little bit of chlorophyll. Um, you could put it in soups or stews to add flavor. You can incorporate it into marinades and dressings. You can flavor fish, poultry, and meat dishes. Um, if anybody wants these recipes, I'm happy to give it to you. Just send me an email. And here's two recipes, an heirloom tomato basil salad. So obviously this is a basil salad where you pick the basil off. You can marinate chicken, lemon chicken. Uh, if you're using fresh, like a fresh oregano, as opposed to a dry oregano. So like, let's say the recipe says a quarter of a teaspoon of dried oregano. You wanna use double the fresh ingredient because it's gonna have water in it. It's gonna have more volume. So you're gonna need double. You're gonna need a half a teaspoon. It's so much better if it's fresh, but you, you definitely want to have more of it. If it's dried, it's not going to have as much. Um, since the meat and not the skin absorbs marinade, I would suggest either skinless chicken breast or, or chicken thighs. Um, tonight I bought, I, I live in Needham, so there's Valente Farms, and I bought like 1.7 pounds of chicken for the four people that live in my house and I it had the skin on it but I take a like a chicken shears and I cut the chicken into like bite-sized pieces and so then I marinate it in whatever I'm marinating and it gets all around it so you can also put chives or sometimes I put um, ginger in it um, this is a dairy-free cilantro pesto. I think that's also in your information package. Um, I'm not going to go over the recipe, but again, I'm always available to chat if you guys are interested. And here's how to use the pesto. You can put pesto on pizza. You can put it on chicken. You can dip it with bread and veggies like you can take carrot and dip it in pesto or, or like let's say you have a crudite you have company and you put a crudite out with celery and peppers um, I don't know you can put like baby tomatoes like the cherry tomatoes carrots cucumber yeah and you can dip it in the pesto um, you can make avocado toast using the pesto bruschetta, breakfast potatoes, muffins. You can put it on anything. It's just adding nutrition to the food. You know, my daughter goes to college. She's 20, right? So the other day I made lentils and I added like all these vegetables in it. Like every time I can like sneak a vegetable in there, I'm like, <laughs> but, but I, I added some chives and everything. And I was like, you can add more vegetables. She's like, why would you want to add vegetables? There are nutrients in the vegetables. Your body needs them. Um, you can add it to salads and sandwiches and a whole, whole host of other things. So that's what I have for you today. I hope that you've learned so much and that you're excited to add all of these recipes and nutrients to your food. And we'd be happy to answer any other questions you have. You want to you want to come up here, so.
keep the keep the ones that like a lot of sun versus you know that they're okay and, and just in the shade. So for instance, basil, even though it wants the sun, it doesn't like to get dry. You know, if it gets that late afternoon sun and it's beating down on that like eight hours, basil's a lot happier and it sort of keeps having more water to it. Whereas some of the rosemary or the lavender, it doesn't the sun doesn't bother it at all. Do you think rosemary is a perennial or can I call it? It came it came back. Yep. <laughs> Everybody's you know diff it's it's different. The the lavender definitely does, but if it gets again cut back, you know if you if it gets too woody and it just gets really unattractive, and then you end up pulling it out. Kind of like the like the cut the whole tree back. Yeah, at the end of the um, season, kind of. Um, unless it's unless it's really woody and you haven't used it, you can still cut it back and let it come back again. Because what happens is it, it just gets, it, it just gets too big and it gets, I mean, I just had a client take one out. It was like third stage. She's like, I'm sick of this. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's a, you just have, and then there's different kinds of lavender too. There's some that get a little pretty things, but you know, most of the clients I, I cut it back on. You know, it's similar to like, um, even catnip, you know, it just gets kind of washed over. I mean, it's not really a mint that anyone really uses in food, but it it just it needs to be trimmed. It gets so eaten. Mint, the mint is what it needs to be trimmed. So basil, would you say? So spearmint really takes over. Um, peppermint is not as aggressive as spearmint, but it 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 definitely. Um, some of the other ones, like there's a, a lemon mint that doesn't go as too crazy, but look at this lemon thyme, this obviously took over. I mean, I took tons of, and there's still plenty there. Mint, and it ha has a way of weaving underneath, mm -hmm. and so it kind of takes over wherever it goes. One of the things that people sometimes do is put it in a pot first. That's what we do. And we plant the pot. We have pots of like chocolate mint. Yep. And Spearmint, that mint, which, which one is that? This one? Yeah. The spearmint? That's spearmint. We have that next to our stairs. Like there's... It goes crazy. It goes crazy. Like constantly I'm pulling it up the, by the roots. Yeah. Like this is the first mint we got so far this year. And it, look how big it is. Mm -hmm. And it can, we just want to be careful because... If you're okay. planting it near a driveway or a walkway, it can get under there and it's it it can make it um, unbalanced. I mean, it really can go crazy. But if you make a lot, you know, drinks and things like that, I used to have people come over. I used to go to my neighbor's too, and then they're like, "Why don't you want to get some spearmint?" And I was like, "Well, I do yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I a couple of years ago, I we always have mint. I went out we have book club, right? And so uh, I'm in my living room, and I decided to put out, like, some strawberries. Or I can't remember. It was some kind of dessert. And I just, like, went out in the garden, and I grabbed some mint, and I put it on everyone's plate. And they were like, where did you get that from? Yeah. I said, it was just in my garden. It was right outside my door. You know how Cindy talks about you should plant herbs. Mm -hmm. yeah. so Functional. Right by my door. So I have, like, several herbs on my front porch, and those are the ones that I go for. I have other herbs like in the backyard. Like I think we have thyme back there. I never go back there. So it's so true. Like it has to be available to you. And it's really important. If you have a business, um, you know, I'm saying this, how much storage is in your business? Is it such a thing that, you know, people just decide to plant their stuff in your front yard? What, what do you get from the storage? For her? Like that high? I would never use a styrofoam. <laughs> uh, like, I'm very careful about the... the and, and this is usually sort of like a third business owner. Like, you don't want to have... So you have so many leaves in your store, but really it's just one. But you are still so worried so about... I use just toxins and the environment. I use leftover pots and tip them. I 
upside down, but still I have enough soil that's way down. Um, but I don't use it for the herbs. I only do that for the flowers. It's nothing that I'm eating. Okay, I got you. But, you know, you, you don't have to go, like if you're going to have a smaller, like when I had the one that the person that had the box, you know, you could do that. But I, I wouldn't use any of the plastic or anything like that to do this. Because anything that you use in your garden is going to get into your body, right? We talk about toxins and removing toxins from the body. I, I do testing for clients, like heavy metal toxicity, um, environmental toxins, molds, plastics, mycotoxins. There are so many mycotoxins in the, in the environment. And there's all these studies that say, well, you can have so much plastic in your body or you can have so much metal in your body. But nobody ever does studies with them synergistically in your body. Your body can only handle so much. Mm -hmm. So you want to avoid at all costs. I mean, we use products on our skin. We use products in our hair, we use deodorant. A lot of people use deodorant that have um, aluminum in it. You know, all of these things that you lather on your body are toxins, they're affecting your thyroid. So I would not use in my plants, I mean, the reason I'm planting things is so that there's no chemicals on them. So that I'm, I don't have to worry about if it's organic or, <laughs> or conventional. Um, and, and what kind of organic sprays they're using in the store. It's just on my front porch. <laughs> <laughs> That's just my opinion. And, you know, everybody does what's best for them. But so, so on a pot, you could, just to continue with that line of thought, put, go with something a little bit wider, and you could put four different um, herbs in that and just add, and then some of the pots are just like some lentils or something. Or you could do one of those, like the strawberry pots. You know, because the soil's in the middle and the openings are on the sides, the roots just go down and find their way into the other soil. But when you're first planting it, it's not, it's not a lot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's how I would do it. And that's a chest pot. But I hope you guys are um, interested in taking, I know it's a little bit messy, but... Um, oh, I would love to. Yes, so you can plant, um, a lot of this has the um, the root with it, and you can take chunks of that. I, you know, I don't mind, and I'll see if I can um, grab some of this, but you can How take about this. storage? Do you have any recommendations? You've got a lot of herbs. How would best you can freeze it. Okay. You, can, uh, you can take some of the, the leaves. You can either just freeze the leaves, or you can put it in a food processor with or like some extra virgin olive oil or avocado oil, and you can put it in little um, ice cube trays. And you can use that in the winter when you need some fresh herbs, you can, there they are. I'm like sitting here. Yeah, they counteract each other so that so the, there's no acid when they okay. use them together. Yeah. Basil and parsley, so there's no aftertaste. If anybody wants the slides or one of the recipes or wants a a URL link to the study that I talked about, the rabbits, just let me know. I'll send it to you. Yeah, I can, um, I have some cards here. So my card's there. Everybody sign the, that's my book, and I think I'm going to donate it to the library. Um, Are you going to talk about it? Oh, do you want me to talk about my book? So, um, 
when my, uh, so I have an 18 year old and a 20 year old. When I was pregnant with my 20 year old in utero, they said, oh, it looks like her kidneys are backed up. And then when she was born, she had, she was diagnosed with hydronephrosis. She had a, a ultrasound and the urologist, when she was four weeks old, four weeks old, put around prophylactic antibiotics to prevent her from getting uh, kidney infections. And so when you're four weeks old, your immune system is just forming. So those prophylactic antibiotics, even though I was breastfeeding, totally wiped out her immune system. Um, cut to six months old and she developed anaphylaxis. She developed allergies. I mean, she was the little bunch, little bunches of O's and P's with eczema behind her knees. When she started crawling, she had eczema on her face. She would rub her face on the rug to itch it. It was awful. We had several emergency room visits. We were the EpiPen family. Um, and then I started a business called Your Food Allergy Coach. I was doing workshops for parents of children with food allergies. Uh, about food allergy etiquette and for preschools and religious schools about how to use an EpiPen and what to do in an emergency situation, uh, have a, a, a plan. But then we learned about the woman in Lexington who did desensitization. She was a health coach and we balanced her microbiome and then we started a desensitization process whereby I was spoon feeding her the small in small increasing amounts of things to which she was allergic to. Um, so I was doing that personally, whereas professionally I was preaching to the allergy community about avoidance and it was a little bit of a conflict of interest for me because I was preaching about avoidance and then giving her the things. She, so I decided to go back to school to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition where I learned so much about nutrition and diets and lifestyles, but it wasn't, and then I published my book, but then it wasn't enough for me scientifically. I, there's a woman who was in IIN and she started a business called the Wildly Successful Health Coach. She's a, a double a MIT grad, so she's a scientist and she went to IFM, which is the Institute for Functional Medicine. She was teaching health coaches, IFM theories and logics about how to reverse the root causes of disease. I was, I'm trained to read lab work from a functional medicine lens. Um, and now my daughter can eat all the things she used to be allergic to. Um, so she's, she still has a little bit of issues with egg. But what we do with our bodies, there is so much we can do with our bodies that we're not even aware of. And just having someone hold your hand and walk through the process is invaluable. You know, I, I mean, I, I could go on forever. I talk all the time, but, <laughs> but my book is a memoir, the story of how we went from birth to her bot mitzvah, basically, because <laughs> I wrote it when she was about 13. So. Thank you so much for coming, you. and I am always available to you. I'll send you a thank you note tomorrow. Um, feel free to ask any questions. And I thank the library for allowing us to speak tonight. This is great.